All right, welcome to the um, talk today with Jim Manico from White House Security, OWASP member. My name is Jennifer Carlson. Um, is everybody having a great day today? <laughs> we have um, over 800 attendees, and we've heard really great feedback from the speakers today, so we're hoping you'll enjoy Jim's today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. We're gonna talk about web application defense. This is primarily from a programming point of view. So this presentation is for software developers, software architects, security professionals who are working with software developers to build primarily secure web applications. And uh, let's rock, shall we? So uh, I'm gonna go through this presentation relatively fast. Please hold your questions to the end. I'll leave a little res uh, information at the end. My last name, my name really is Jim Manico. That's Manic with an O, I am Manic. I'm gonna go really fast through this, charge. I wanna cover as much material as we can. I'm also one of the, I'm one of the board members for OWASP. OWASP is of course another nonprofit security foundation. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit charitable organization. We give everything away for free and try to help individuals and organizations improve information security. As a professional, I work for Web, White Hat Security. I'm one of the uh, uh, security architects for the company. I'm on the road a lot. I'm really just a booth babe, and I'm proud to be a booth babe. <laughs> I live on Kauai and uh, Aloha. So let's, are you ready to rock? Yeah. Oh, come on, folks. I didn't, are you ready to rock? Web security, yeah! yeah. <laughs> what is this? I see a lot of people talking about APT. Oh no, APT, yeah, whatever. I see your APT and I raise you, single quote, semicolon. This is a SQL injection attack. Could do a lot of massive damage with two characters, right? So here we have a simple edit user form. We're trying to edit the email address of a certain user. We wanna update the user table. We're gonna set the new email equals single quote to be a new untrusted email address, single quote, where the ID is a trusted user ID from the session. A really common feature in web application development. So here's my super awesome APT hack. Single quote, semicolon. We inject that single quote, semicolon, into the middle of this query right here. Bang. So that's the uh, untrusted data in red that's gonna manipulate the query. It's changing the whole structure of the query. That semicolon in SQL, it ends the query early. So this is the query that the database ends up seeing. APT, right? Single quote, semicolon. I'm still worried about the 13 year olds in their basement hacking your website while his mom is going, Jimmy, it's dinner time. Yes, mom, one second, I'm hacking a major corporation. So what will this query do? Update users, set email to be blank. It will wipe the email address out of the entire database. How's that gonna affect your day? Game over, right? So how do you stop, how do you actually fix this? Only one way to fix this. Look, web application firewalls have their place, I'll talk about that. Input validation is an important programming technique, but these are partial defenses at best. Only one technique stops SQL injection, that's query parameterization. In all of secure coding and defensive coding, this is by far the most important slide in the deck. This is the PHP PDO library. PHP by far is the most popular programming language that drives the web today. The PDO library is the database interaction library, and the dollar sign email and ID, that's untrusted data, that's input from the user. We're gonna bind that untrusted data through the bind param statement into these placeholders, new email and user ID. For database geeks, this will basically run two passes into the database. Pass one, they'll build the, the query plan with this structure. Pass two, they'll send the untrusted data in and there's no way to conduct SQL injection. There's no way to manipulate the structure of the query from that point on. Every, and I can't sell you something here. This is not a, a tool or a product. It's knowledge, it's a technique. At OWASP, we have a cheat sheet on this called the OWASP Query Parameterization Cheat Sheet, which you can use to give to your developers. The same technique's available in .NET, the same basic concept. We have untrusted text, um, the password and name that's coming from open text fields. We bind those into these name and password placeholders. And here we have our, our query where we're injecting untrusted data into it, but we do the bind. We put the untrusted data in through a bind statement and injection goes away. Again, query parameterization. It's also available in Java. So we have the same kind of query 
question mark is our placeholders where untrusted data will land. We have our set string or sent int, int calls which bind untrusted data into these placeholders and injection goes away. So the thing is, this is also a problem in object query databases. And uh, we, we've, we've used the, uh, uh, an API called Hibernate for a long time. It's an object relational mapping engine. The same language, object query, the object query language is used in NoSQL databases today. So NoSQL uses SQL, let's be honest with you. So there, a lot of the NoSQL databases still have an OQL interface into them to talk to their objects, and you have to talk to those databases in a parameterized way. We have the emp ID placeholder, and we're gonna bind the untrusted ID into that placeholder, and what's that? Injection goes away. That's right, Thomas, that's right. So Ruby on Rails has a special relationship with query parameterization. It's one of the only languages in the history of programming language that has a query parameterization API, even when developers do the right thing, the framework has failed brutally in the past. So here we have an example of a query um, where we're, uh, the active record API in Ruby on Rails, we're gonna try to retrieve all objects from this list of IDs. If any of those are a string, Ruby on Rails, earlier versions of Ruby on Rails would just attach those together through string building, which is the anti-pattern that will cause SQL injection. This problem happened in Ruby on Rails 325, 315, and 3013 and earlier. And Ruby on Rails 1 and 2 is vulnerable to this, to this day. So if you're gonna drive Ruby on Rails as part of your company, look, subscribe to their security list, be ready to patch and patch fast, and also make sure that you're not like hacking the core. Sometimes when you're doing Ruby on Rails, a developer who's maybe new at the framework They'll just modify parts of the core to get things done, and then patching becomes almost impossible. So code to gem using the official gem standard. Don't mess with the core of Ruby on Rails as much as if you, want, if you care about patching, and be ready to patch fast. There's been multiple problems with the framework. And again, even when developers do the right thing, we've seen problems. Cold Fusion. Anybody here? Cold Fusion is a pretty awful language. I'm sorry, I, I don't like Cold Fusion. But it has a query parameterization API to stop injection. Perl. All right, who here does Perl? Who here does or has done Perl? See, look at this guy. He was like, yeah, I, I do Perl. Be proud. Perl, yeah. yeah. It's OK, Perl. Even though it's probably the most unmaintainable language in the history of programming, it's still be proud. Written by a pretty insane linguist, right? So it's OK. I survived the Perl era. That's kind of. Be proud. <laughs> and it has had one of the earliest query parameterization, hey, Baba, hey, what's up? The earliest query parameterization APIs, the Perl DBI API, injection goes away, and it's pretty straightforward to use. So the good thing here is, this is probably the, the biggest risk to programming on the web, and one of the easier ones to fix. If you can't get your hands around this, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. This is like, when I approach a big company, who has a lot of problems with SQL injection, I recommend, look, stop everything, do a big pass through your code base, just fix all the injection and get that done first and we'll deal with other things later. That's a good initial step when you're uh, approaching web security for the first time as a big organization. So this talk is sponsored by Starbucks Espresso. You think I'm crazy now? Mm. Pardon me? Just, just, just to split hairs, if you have numeric input going into queries, and you, and you validate those as just numerics, eh, this, you can't really do injection through that. It's the open string input, like a comments field or a chat box, or when you're allowing punctuation and internationalization through certain larger text fields, the, if, almost any defense is, is not gonna be effective except for query parameterization. Now, Again, if you're just passing untrusted numerics into web application, it's pretty easy to validate that and force input to a numeric. But still, I I, my code, I parameterize everything, injection goes away. It's, it's, a, it's a really big deal. If you do have injection, I can pretty much steal any data. In most cases, I can update or modify any data, and I can often run operating system commands through SQL functions. And like by the movie Aliens 2, that one guy had a grenade, like 10 aliens were ch chasing him. Game over, man! It's like that. Yeah, it is. So dot, here's hope for a better future. This is the .NET Link API. It's another object relational mapping engine to a database. And when developers use Link, this is Link for SQL, 
they do their mapping, they can just write a query. See, it's an object query. Whenever it starts with the from, that's usually an object query. So here's an object query. There's no parameterization. They're just throwing untrusted input into the query. Injection goes away automatically. This is my hope for a better future, right? Hope that the frameworks, especially technical vulnerabilities, can be addressed in the framework itself. We have a ways to go to get there, but I see a lot of uh, security researchers out there, Ivan Ristic and the Apache Foundation. I see uh, Mike Samuel from Google that are building injection-resistant APIs for things like XSS and SQL injection that build the defense in automatically. It's gonna take time, we will get there. Next, let's talk about passwords. Here's some basic things. Um, disable the autocomplete cache in your browser. Do you ever go to a website and you're typing in your credit card number and the website says, oh, don't worry, we know your credit card already and they just fill it out for you because you've typed it in in a previous website? And how does the browser store this autocomplete data? Good cryptographic sound principles, right? No, it's a text file. So in my websites, I like to turn off autocomplete so the browser doesn't cache every user's keystroke. Only send passwords over an HTTPS post, basic stuff. Don't display passwords in the browser, basic stuff. But let's talk about how to store a password successfully. Who here has got some good crypto background? Who here doesn't mind if I geek out on some deep crypto? Okay, who here is like, Jim, please don't go there. All right, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna go there, bear with me. How do you store a password securely? Number one, don't store it in plain text, right? If you ever visit a website, you say forgot password, and they email you the password, that means they're storing it either in plain text or in a symmetric crypto reversible way. Either way, it's a usually bad principle to store that password. We wanna make sure that we store a password in a way that's verifiable when a user gives us their password, but it's not reversible in any way. So that's where one-way algorithms like a hash, PBKDF2, a key stretching algorithm, or um, an HMAC, an authenticated hash, come into play. Let's talk about that. Here are some basic principles around password storage. Number one, don't limit the power of a user's password, the strength of a user's pa uh, password. If you ever go to a banking website and you give them your password and they say, oh, wait a second, wait a second, it's too long, you're using characters we don't like, can you please make your password simpler for us? <laughs> ever experienced that? That's, that's, that, that means they're, they're not storing your password and as sound a way as they can. It limits their ability to, to apply cryptographic strength to that password storage mechanism. Next, use a salt. This is not a spice. This is a cryptographic nonce. So whenever a user first creates a password, uh, registers a new account with your system, just generate a long random number, 32 characters is what I use, and stick it in the, and stick it in the user table for that user. Then whenever we're gonna protect the password, we don't protect the password by itself, we put this random string in front of the password and then protect it. This, def this does two things. It provides a cryptographic technique called deduplication. So even if you and I have the same password, by using a random salt unique to every user, our passwords, are, are, are the cache of our password, the ciphertext of our password will never be the same. So when I mean hash, I mean one-way algorithm, not what you LA people think of that, so. <laughs> So, pardon me? Uh, I put it right on the user table. Uh, storing, taking your salts and hiding them provides no cryptographic benefit. Now, I do hide them, actually. I will take my salt and do something called salt isolation. I'll put half of the salt in the database and half of the salt in a configuration file until the attacker needs both access to get the full salt. But, but look, if you're doing this right, it shouldn't matter. Salt should be able to be public and still your system should not be compromised. That's the, the theory, at least. Make the salts big as well. And generate them randomly. Oh, and if you're in Java, secure random and random are not random. So use secure random with uh, good reseeding to get your best bet at a real random number. Okay, moving on. So here's the best way to do password storage. Use an HMAC. An HMAC is an authenticated hashing algorithm. It's a one-way hashing algorithm that requires a cryptographic key to even apply the algorithm. Now, why this is the best path is because it is super fast and it's scalable. A lot of the people in the industry say use bcrypt, use scrypt, use pbkdf2. These are very slow algorithms. Who here has been a developer in their life? All right, Pearl guy, Pearl guy. So has anyone ever told you, can you please write this code so it's really slow on purpose, really slow? <laughs> Have you ever heard that? 
It's, it's not a good idea. So a lot of the advice we get from the security industry around password storage, I think, is really wrong. If you're a big bank, a big institution, if, you're, uh, if you have really radical security needs, you should have the ability to store a key in a secure way. The best way to store a key, a, a, a private key, is with an HSM, a hardware security module. These, are, these have come radically down in price. These are physical devices for key storage. They, uh, even Amazon Cloud and other cloud providers offer them now. If you can store a key securely, rock with an HMAC. Because now we can, and the HMAC is a one-way algorithm that's also very cryptographically sound because of this key. So we take the salt from the user table, we grab the password they're trying to store or they're trying to log in as, we grab the key from the HSM and call an HMAC. This is now a super fast one-way algorithm that's verifiable but not reversible. This is why I recommend an HMAC if you have performance needs in mind. Now suppose you're not a big bank, you're SMB, or you have a, a lower number of users that are logging in concurrently. Here's a second choice where scalability doesn't matter. Use a slow algorithm. So we have, the, the, my favorite is PBKDF2. This is formally called a key stretching algorithm. It takes a password and creates a large cryptographic key from that password in a predictable way. You also can give PBKDF2 a work factor that will slow down the algorithm. So things like a dictionary attack against your password storage or things or other kinds of attacks against password storage will, will, will be slowed down dramatically. What's funny is that attackers have like, for five grand, the attacker can go buy a video game rig and slap a couple video cards into it. And they have a supercomputer for five grand that used to cost the industry like $50 million to build even just a couple years ago. So computing power, Moore's, Moore's law, still reigns supreme. So um, we want to be able to slow this algorithm way down. 10 million on a, on a high-speed computer will delay this algorithm to about six seconds to compute where a, a work factor of like 100,000 will be like a second or so. And so this is a, a reasonable choice as a slow, one-way, verifiable, but not reversible algorithm for password storage. But if you have like a couple hundred thousand users logging in concurrently, you're done. Denial of service. Another, another option, if you don't like PBKDF2, this is more for nation-state level threat agents. We have S-Crypt. S-Crypt will even resist custom hardware attacks because it takes up a lot of RAM for that moment of computation and it's very slow. It takes up a lot of resources to compute, but it's a great algorithm because, again, even somebody with like, you know, thousands of acres worth of hardware simultaneously cracking your algorithm will have trouble because of how much RAM it takes up for each computation round. And there's a lot of configuration plugs into S-Crypt, it's pretty much my favorite choice today when scalability doesn't matter for me. When scalability matters, use an HMAC. Hope you had fun, next topic. What do we have here, anybody know what game this is on screen here? World of Warcraft, there's like, what is it? This is a, a Lathandra guard and some necromancer with his fireballs. He's got his hand of death spell, some cool magic swords. Yeah, let's go World of Warcraft. Who here has played World of Warcraft before? Are you okay? Are you all right? Are you, re are you recovered? I have recovered? Go through th World of Warcraft therapy? Yeah. Otherwise known as going out in the real world, right? Yeah. Even <laughs> yeah. So that's the advice to World of Warcraft people to have a kid. That's a great piece of advice. So, <laughs> so look, why is, this, why is World of Warcraft important in a web security talk? What did they offer to the world four and a half years ago? Here's a hint, here's a little hint. Multi-factor authentication. This is the first example of a mass rollout of multi-factor authentication to tens of millions of consumers. It was relatively successful, relatively successful. So who offers multi-factor authentication today? Everybody know what MFA is? Do we all know what MFA is? Something you have, something you know, or something you are. Yes, Tin. That really hurts my feelings. That, 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 that got me right there, Tin. Right there. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that offline. And you're right. You're right. We should, we should offer it. No, no question about it. And Tin, no, we're working on it. It's on our product roadmap, and we'll talk about that later. OK, moving on. <laughs> I, I had to use my commercial, commercial voice for that. All right, back to, back to the real world here. So we have Google, right? Google's offered multi-factor for a couple years. Facebook, yeah, they offer multi-factor. PayPal, Apple. We saw like a, a Wired Magazine 
uh, Wired Magazine editor had his whole eye, eye account popped and uh, all his devices remote wiped. Apple offers, Apple offers multi-factor. Amazon Cloud. Dropbox leverages Google. Blizzard's offered it for four and a half years. The Steam Network, Yahoo offers it. We have seen in the industry that it's possible to roll out multi-factor to millions of users in a relatively cost-effective way. So, here are some basic considerations for MFA. How do you send the token? Biometrics is not reasonable to roll out to a lot of consumers yet. I've, I've never seen a, a biometric mass rollout that's been reasonable, uh, cost-effective-wise. So something you have and something you know are the reasonable two factors. So how do you send the token? The user's logging in. We want to get them a six to 10-digit token, maybe longer. You can email it to them. Now, that's not a great idea. It's the worst of all. But it sure is better than passwords alone. Next best is SMS. It is possible to sniff SMS, but you need very illegal gear to do it, federally illegal gear to do it. You have to be within physical proximity of that user. So it's it, people, oh, I can sniff SMS. It's, not, it's, usually not, it's usually not a practical attack, though. Mobile native app. This is a, a better choice, I think, uh, depending on your mobile OS. I don't want to trash any specific mobile OS, Android, but uh, um, <laughs> depending on your OS, this is, a, this is a usually a reasonable choice. Dedicated token, um, I'm, this is one of the better choices. This is what Blizzard did, and um, PayPal offers dedicated tokens. I'm not endorsing any of these companies. They do offer dedicated, multi-factor, pretty rigorous tokens. I like printed tokens as well. This is interesting. When you first flip on multi-factor in your Google account, they will let, let you print out a list of one-time use backup codes. This is a, a pretty reasonable way to roll as well. Many European banks do this as well. This is just a high level talk on this, but the point is it's really possible to do this not just for internal systems, but for mass rollouts. So how does Google handle thick clients? When you flip on multi-factor, like on my machine here, my contacts, my chat, it's all, my thick clients are all driven by a password. And as soon as I flipped on multi-factor, th those all stopped working. So you go into Google, log in, they make you log in again. You can specify specific, yeah, you can specify specific one-time, one-app specific passwords that are very long that you can then use for your thick clients. And if these passwords are stolen and they're used in a different client, they immediately become invalid. So it's not perfect, it's pretty reasonable. So how do you handle unavailable MFA devices. What if someone loses their phone or loses their token? We have, I like printed backup codes. We have fallback mechanisms. Let's use email now, uh, possibly a call-in center. And uh, the, these, are, uh, these, are, uh, these are reasonable choices for multi-factor workflow. This is just a high-level talk on the topic, but uh, it's something that is possible to do even, even with millions of users. And if you're a finance org, even the US bank, banking system, some of the last banks in the world to do this, are now doing a fairly big rollout to multi-factor. It improves a lot in terms of protecting your front gate. It's not perfect security, but it's a huge improvement. We should consider it. Here's an example of a multi-factor workflow, the forgot password feature. Most US banks have gotten this right for a very long time. So when you, when you use a bank, do they ever email you anything anymore about your account? Or they, the, do banks send you password reset links? No, because email is an insecure protocol, an insecure transport protocol. Even when you're using Gmail, the connection between your browser and Gmail might be encrypted with TLS, but the communication between the Gmail server and through the internet gear, through the internet, uh, uh, to the other server is all plain text. So your threat agents are like backbone providers, some ISPs and stuff like that. So that may or may not matter to you, but for banks it does. So when you go to try to, when you try to reset your password at a big bank, they start by saying what's your name, what's your account number, uh, what's your email address, usually two questions about who you are. Then they possibly will ask, what's your, uh, ask for your security question. Security questions, there's no great security question. At best, there's good security questions. One of the cheat sheets at OWASP is the using and choosing security questions. It's a, it's a worthwhile read, one of our better mini guides. So now that we know who you are, send the user a token using one of the methods we described before. Email it if you have to, SMS is a pretty common mechanism. Maybe a dedicated token, some banks offer that. Now they got the token, put that token in the session, and now let them reset their password. 
This is a reasonable workflow. And that token should only be usable in the same browser that's in the middle of the forgot password workflow. It, shouldn't, it should be useless by itself. So this is a forgot password cheat sheet at OWASP talks about this as well. So I'm gonna go fast through this. I'm gonna sit down for a moment. So XSS, this is cross-site scripting. It's like the cockroach of the internet. You fix one and five more pop up. Some of the most elite programming teams in the world fail to stop XSS. Google has some pretty sophisticated developers. We still see Dom XSS and Deeper XSS and some of their programs on a fairly regular basis. So it's just, it's no attack on them. This is just a really brutally complex risk to fix. I'm gonna, let, let's slam through this. So these two attacks here, the first one is a session theft. Suppose we're both logged into the same website together and I send this message to you, this little chunk of JavaScript, and you're not doing proper output encoding and this message hits the, uh, the victim's browser and it executes, this code will grab a copy of the cookie, that's the session identifier, which tracks the user being logged in, attaches it to an evil URL, to an evil person server, and then redirects the user to that server in some way. And we can even do this stealthy and put it in an image tag, simple get request. And now we've very simply hijacked the user session and can take over their active account. The next one here is a, a basic targeted site defacement. I'm using the blink tag. The only better tag than the blink tag is the marquee tag. Okay, that's, that, was a, that was a really bad programming joke, I'm sorry. Marquee tag, anyone, anyone. I'm alone here. You like the marquee, okay, thank you, thank you. Tim, I know you'd like the marquee tag. That's here. All right, all right. What's that? Yeah, exactly. So other things we can do with XSS are things like uh, we can load remote scripts, execute any JavaScript on that page, we can steal any data from the page, we can uh, trap the mouse up and mouse down events and do keystroke logging. We, this is really a serious risk. And SQL injection is on the decrease by some people's statistics. It's harder to find SQL injection in top tier sites. So we do see XSS on the rise in terms of potential attacks, a little bit at least. So this is how you stop it. It's a technique called output encoding. And based on where, is it, and you do this defense primarily in the user interface. Other techniques like a firewall, web application firewall, that's got its place in the world. We have input validation that's helpful in some places, but these are partial defenses. These are not absolute defenses depending on the kind of input you have to display to another user. So output encoding, this is in the user interface, converting any output data to a string only context is the absolute defense that will truly stop this risk. What happens when the browser body sees this character? It's a less than sign. It thinks you're starting a new HTML tag. It's a meta character, it's code. It's not a, text, a piece of text for display. It's a meta character that will cause, that will start potential code execution in the browser in some way. So how do we display this character? For the new car, new Mercedes, free trip to Hawaii. Yes, I, I'm ready for that, are you ready? How do you display this character in the body of a browser in a way that's displayable, but doesn't actually start a new HTML tag? What is it? Are you, are you missing a character, are you sure? For the new car, for the trip to Hawaii. <laughs> That's exactly correct, ampersand LT semicolon. I was lying about the car and trip, but I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but, but you were exactly correct, thank you sir. This is called an HTML entity. When the browser sees this chunk of code, it will display a less than symbol but it will not start a new HTML tag. We have now diffused that attack through output encoding. This is a programming technique. It's not a, a box or something to sell. It's a programming technique, which we give away for free at OWASP through our various guides. So knowledge is the most important tool in the world of information security, in my opinion. So in the world of Java, we have a, one of the projects from OWASP that I feel is very production quality. We have a quality problem at OWASP. We're a nonprofit, and a lot of the things we do are good research projects. As a board member, I'm trying hard to push the organization to really focus on production quality projects for developers. I feel this is one of them. This is written by Jeff Ikonowski, who is a compiler theory PhD student. 
um, has built a web application for some of the largest SaaS players. He donated his encoder to us. It's the Java encoder. This is important because Java as a language does not have an encoder built in like .NET does. And so we have a user interface here. You know, we're building some form tags, we're building some buttons, we're building some dynamic JavaScript. Programmers will build this markup and inject untrusted data in the middle of this markup to build a web page, really common technique. Here we have a basic input field from a form, and we have this untrusted data, so we wrap it around in code for HTML attribute, and regardless of what JavaScript attack gets there, it's diffused and converted to a string for display only. Same thing here in the text area, in code for HTML content. Same thing here for an event handler in JavaScript, in code for JavaScript attribute. And same thing here for a JavaScript block, a message variable, in code for JavaScript block. There's about 15 or so different APIs you need to really stop XSS. These are different contexts within a web document, and it is kind of complex, unfortunately. I, it is possible to build very XSS-resistant applications. I was working for one company a few years back, and we, we were in the middle of a merger, merger and acquisition. Billions of dollars were on the table, no exaggeration, and we got tested. We had like 130,000 XSS. And the, the company said, we, we need to fix all of these. And we're like, well, it's, it's going to be really tough for us to do that. And they're like, well, if you fix them all, we'll give you a couple billion dollars. We're like, hmm, okay. So we, the last test, we fixed all of them. And it was painful, but it's doable. The right motivation. <laughs> you know, for most people, it's like a couple billion dollars. But for me, it's like, I'll buy an ice cream cone. I'm like, I'm in. So I'm, I'm easier. But for some, they want the billions of dollars, whatever. Do you have any ice cream by chance? No? All right, never mind. <laughs> So the jo here's another like weird edge case. If we're building dynamic JavaScript on the server, there's a different kind of encoding we need. So again, it is very complex. There's lots of these little weird edge cases. At the very least, we can easily stop the obvious ones. These edge cases account for only about 2% of all XSS. The other techniques will account for the vast majority. Depends on what you're trying to do. There's also DOM XSS, which makes this an even more confusing issue. We have things like we need to avoid certain APIs in JavaScript. We need to uh, avoid certain code execution contexts like the eval statement in JavaScript. We want to treat untrusted data as string display data only. There's safe APIs we want to use to build a dynamic interface. We want to parse JSON in a specific way. This does get kind of gnarly, but it is possible. When we, developers are sharp people. Just to get a basic application on the web working is like five different programming languages. We have our configuration files. We have SQL, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, some language server side like Java. There's a lot of things we need to know just to build a basic web application with the right motivation, right? Motivation? A few, few billion dollars, right? Ice cream, depending on your perspective. We can fix this stuff. It's not, I'm sorry? Sparkly objects for you, okay. Uh, you're talking diamonds, aren't you? Okay, all right, we'll talk about that later. I love my wife, I love my wife. All right, so jQuery. So even some of the most popular JavaScript libraries, jQuery is used on almost every top tier website in the planet, and it is very vulnerable to XSS. We have the .text API, which is uh, safe, and we have the .html, which will take any code and execute it. So even our popular libraries have problems. And there's things like the jQuery encoder to let us do encoding deep in JavaScript itself. One more for XSS, we have a tool called TinyMCE. This is very common in web programming. TinyMCE, it will convert a text area to a little mini editor. So here's just a web form, but in this form you have bold, italics, underline, different coloring, numbered lists. And when you submit this text area, it submits as a chunk of HTML. I can easily slip some JavaScript in here, which may execute later. Now, how do you clean this up? Anybody here want to build a regular expression for me to parse HTML? Anyone? No, it's not a doable thing. You can't just validate this. If we output and code it, it will show up as code, not like this, like we want to display. So we need something special here. We need to do HTML policy-based parsing and validation. So at OWASP, we have the HTML sanitizer project, which is, again, it's not an uh, academic project. It was written by Michael Samuel from Google. 
and he donated it to OWASP. But I'm looking at this code going, this crazy dude wrote his own HTML parser from scratch to do this. So I called up Michael, I'm like, Michael, you're doing your own raw parsing? Would you have like a PhD in computer science or something? He's like, oh yeah, I do, Jim. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so, so okay, Mike, Dr. Dr. Samuel, I get it. And, it's, it is a, and the best thing about this is, it's documented well, it's a complete project, we have found bugs in it, and he fixes it in a couple hours. Other competing projects at OWASP, the ESAPI project, it's got a lot of big press behind it. No fixes since July of 2011. And if, as a developer, when I see that, and I get it, it's not a, I'm not trying to attack that project, I am, but um, when, I, when, I, when I see this problem, as a developer, I'm like, I'm not gonna touch this, this is, no one's actively maintaining it. And that's crucial if you want to build a security library. So these are actively maintained. And the moment they stop being actively maintained, I will stop endorsing them. But this is a great open source project for this other weird edge case around XSS defense that actually just pop up a lot. And easy to use. Let me show you one more thing. These HTML sanitizers are in multiple languages. In for pure JavaScript, like Web 3.0 applications, we have Bleach. Um, uh, Python, and we have the Google Kaha project, an open source HTML sanitizer. We have the Python Bleach project for HTML sanitization. We have the HTML purifier project in PHP, and it's built into .NET, the anti-XSS get safe HTML APIs. So let me jump ahead here. Cross-site request forgery. About quick, quick note, content security policy, it's going through the W3C standard process right now. It's an awesome standard to stop XSS. I figure it's gonna be in mass use in about two or three years. Take a look at content security policy, keep your eye on it. I don't think it's worth implementing so much today, but it will be worth implementing at scale in just a couple of years. So next, cross-site request forgery. Who's heard of this attack? CSRF. This is really on the rise in a lot of ways. Um, there's still a large number of sites who do not protect against this. The problem with how your browser works, when you log into a website, they'll give you a session cookie. Anytime you make a request back to that domain, the session cookie will get attached to that request automatically regardless of where that request came from. This is just how the browser works. So suppose you're logged into your bank. It's called mybank.com. That's not a real bank. It's a, we're protecting the innocent here or the guilty in this case. So um, we have cross-site request forgery. You have logged into this bank and then you either opened up a new tab or opened up a new window for the, of that same browser. The cookie cache is shared, not specific to every tab, it works for the whole browser. If we isolated cookies per each tab, then advertising would stop work, and oh, we would never want that to happen, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, I had trouble swallowing that. Okay, so, um, so mybank.com, transfer funds. Oh, as a quick note, about five years ago, uh, there was a browser security meeting, and I proposed something called cookie cache isolation. To, to limit cookies to one tab only. And there was, all the browser vendors were there at a big OWASP meeting and they laughed me out of the room. And like, yeah, yeah, whatever. They're all funded by advertising. So all of them are. So luckily, oh, thank God, Firefox just rolled out and Firefox, what is it? Firefox 372 or something? What are they? <laughs> well, they're up to 20, 20, right? In Firefox 20, you can now open a new isolated tab which provides cookie cache isolation. So I'm really happy to see that feature. There are additional privacy features finally showing up in the browsers. I'm very happy to see that. Enough consumers are demanding this now. So be, but be, because of how most browsers work, um, when I host a request like this on an evil website, so we're logged into mybank.com, we're actively logged in, and now we visit evil.com. We have a form that will transfer funds to this account for a thousand bucks and then automatically submit it over JavaScript. So the user didn't initiate this action and we can easily hide this form on an evil website and if you're logged into your bank, that, will, that request will fire, the cookie that, that logs you in will go with it and the, the, the request is submitted. We can do multi-step transactions, we can hide these in image tags for get request. There's all kinds of way to blindly force a user to make a request that will attach the session cookie with it. How do we stop this, this problem? The main defense people talk about is the synchronizer token pattern. When the user first logs in, we generate a random value for that user only, for that login session only, and stick it in the session. 
Whenever we build a sensitive form, like some kind of transfer money form, we add a new hidden variable with that random token that's unique to this user session. When they submit this sensitive form, we grab this, the random value off the hidden variable, we compare it to what's in the session. If they're not equal, we reject that request. The problem with that defense is if someone steals your session, they can get around this. If there's an XSS vulnerability, they can get around this. If, uh, so there's multiple ways to hijack a session and then the synchronize your token pattern becomes useless. So I still think you should do it, but in order to really have good CSRF defense, you need to be bulletproof from stopping XSS. And Tin, how's that? That's really tough, isn't it? That's even for the best companies in the world with the best SDLCs, XSS will still pop up. And uh, we want to require users to re-authenticate to kind of enhance the security of, of, of um, simulated requests like this. So what do I mean by re-authentication? Whenever we have a change password, uh, a, a form like this, need a little, need a little espresso, a little espresso. Ah, there we go, okay. So we, we, whenever a user tries to change their password, we ask for their new password as well as their old password. So if someone has stolen that session, whether you're logged in at a library and some a library with books, paper books, right? So you're at a library logged in, you forget to log out, someone else uses your terminal, they see you logged into Amazon, oh yeah, change password, they're gonna be forced to re-authenticate. This is an old defense. But here's a defense I don't see in that many websites. It's re-authentication when the user tries to change their email address. So think about that. Why is it a bad idea if your change email address form is vulnerable to CSRF? As the attacker, if I can change the email address attached to your account, I can usually hijack that account through forgot password and take over the whole account. So most websites that care about security, the big ones, they protect their change user or change email feature with re-authentication. In the upper left-hand corner, we have amazon.com. I'm trying to change my email address. They're demanding the password here. And we have, uh, so we have meetup.com, okay, meetup. I'm trying to change my email address. They want the password to let that happen. My good friends at Twitter, they're trying to, I'm trying to change my email address. They're requiring the password. And even Facebook, yes, even Facebook. There's a little editorial there, okay. So I'm trying to change my email address. They require a password. So a lot of big name sites do this. Very few, uh, less than mainline sites do this. I, it's easy to implement. I highly encourage you to add this to your SDLC for security. I'm gonna violate a, a little bit of copyright law here. I'm glad nobody from Lucasfilms is in the room, thank God. So let's talk about access control. So this is the way most, this is the way most uh, access control has been designed. This used to be the front page of MySpace a long time ago. And I had this manager during the acquisition who would show up and like edit the AP news feeds and change the homepage with bad pronunciation and put a lot of political jargon on there. And I'm like, okay, you bought the site, you do whatever you want with it. I went to his boss and his boss said, Jim, cut this out. We'll get in so much trouble for this. Can I turn him off as a manager? They're like, no, he just, he's like bought us. I'm like, okay, what can I do? They're like, do something creative. I'm like, all right, so homepage of MySpace. If the user is a manager or if the user is an administrator or if the user is an editor and the user is not my crazy manager Joe, then let them edit. So this is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so this is uh, um, role-based access control. I'm not asking about what, what uh, I'm not asking about the feature they're editing or the feature they're executing. I'm asking who is this person? That's a bad idea. So the problem with this kind of coding is, what if you want to change the policy of your code? You have to write new code and push it live. Hope it didn't break anything, right? And if, if someone says, I want to audit your code for security, and they're like, well, what's your access control policy? The answer is, oh, just go read the code. Yeah, good luck with that. So there's a, and it's also very fragile. You have to add this code to every file by hand. This is old school access control. A lot of analysts say this is the new way to write code. It is completely wrong. It is a anti-pattern from an access control point of view. It addresses hierarchy up and down a hierarchy, but what if you and I have the same role? Should I be able to edit your email address or execute reports as if I was you or take actions as if I was you? No way. So we wanna have a more granular way of doing access control that's still easy to program. Let's talk about that. 
So the only library I've ever seen that does what I call permission-based access control is the Apache Shiro project. This is a, a very powerful and easy to use Java project. It's from the Apache project. It's highly robust and well-maintained. 50 people are working on it. They push out patches on a regular basis and, and all, the, all the defaults for this library, it's a security library, are, have relatively secure defaults. It's good for crypto authentication and access control is my favorite piece of this. Let's break some copyrights here. So I have a question for you. Let's build a video game. Let's build a Star Wars video game, right? So in this video game, we have about 10,000 access control checks to see who can wield a lightsaber. So I have a, it's a quiz question time. Who was the first character in the Star Wars series to wield a lightsaber, right? Obi-Wan Kenobi, I like you, okay, so. If the user is a Jedi, then let them wield a lightsaber. Let's add that code to 10,000 locations, regression test, unit test, push it live, hope you didn't break anything. So next, who's the next character to wield a lightsaber? Luke, and what was he at the time? It's a Padawan, right. So if the user is a Jedi, or if the user is a Padawan, then let them wield a lightsaber. Regression test, unit test, push it live, 10,000 places, hope you didn't break anything. Who's next? Darth Vader, he's a Sith. If the user is a Jedi, or if the user is a Padawan, or if the user is a Sith, let them wield a lightsaber, regression test, unit test, 10,000 places, and hope you didn't break anything. Exactly. This is a tough one now. Who's next? Pardon me? Han wielding a lightsaber. Yeah, he wields a lightsaber. Yeah, he that doesn't count. It's not. Yeah, it's not in battle. Th that, 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 you you are you are technically correct. I'm going to fix my slide deck. I apologize <laughs> after I get sued by Lucasfilms, but that was not a war action. So in the video game, it was a special. Uh, it was a special challenge that you have to say. You have a list. How do you open this case? I'll kick it. I'll steal Luke's lightsaber and whack it. But it's not actual battle action, so it doesn't count in this game even though you were right. Who's the next character to wield a lightsaber in battle in the Star Wars series? He's a Jedi, we have him covered already. Hmm? <laughs> she's, she's either a Padawan or a Jedi. So I'm, you're, you are beating me at this, and I, and I, and I, I applaud the depth of your, of your Star Wars geekery. You're the man. <laughs> In the, in the secondary series, there was this robot, right? General? Grievous. General Grievous. And technically, General Grievous was not a Jedi or a Sith. He was actually a warrior who was trained in the art of lightsaber battle by General Sidious. He does, doesn't have force powers, so he's a special case. <laughs> so <laughs> if the user is a Jedi, or if the user is a Padawan, or if the user is a Sith, or if the user is General Grievous, the Jedi-killing robot cyborg, then let them wield a lightsaber. Ready? Regression test. Unit test. Push it live 10,000 places and hope. Hope you didn't break anything. That's the problem with role based access control. So, what we need is something better. We need, sorry, to, oh, we need this. We need permission based access control. Let's code it this way. If the user is permitted to wield a lightsaber, then let them do it. You will never have to change this code ever again in 10,000 places. Now, this is not checking who the user is. This is not checking for a role. It's checking to see what their action is. And we code it once and leave it alone. 10,000 places. But now, under is permitted, we may be doing role checks or capabilities checks or some database check, that's fine. But in our mammoth attack surface where we're coding our policy, we don't have to touch that ever again. And this is a very subtle but incredibly important aspect to getting access control right in a complicated web application. So that's my, my take on access control. Click jacking. How, mu how much time do I have, by the way? Oh, perfect. So click jacking. What's clickjacking? Clickjacking is an abuse of opacity. It's an abuse of, it used to be called UI redress. It's an abuse of framing. And let, let's talk about this. So, so in this super fun game, look, this is hosted at evil.com, right? Evil.com. And so you think you're playing a super fun game, but because you're logged into Gmail, I can open up a frame on this evil web page 
and load the inbox of Google in this frame and set the width to be 300, set the height to be 100, absolute position up front, and then let the, let the opacity be zero so it looks like it's invisible, right? So, we, so even though it's clickable, it's invisible, we can't see it, but it's clickable. And now it's time to play some super fun games with Google, right? So everybody with me, get ready to click one player. Everybody with me, one, one player, are you ready? ready? One player, three, two, one, click. Ooh, select all. So let's start the game, you ready? Look at start game. One, two, three, click. Ooh, delete everything. That is, that is click jacking, right? How do we stop this? It's really difficult to stop this risk against a very savvy attacker. The best we have is a response header called the XFO, X frame option header. This is a technique called frame busting. We want to stop, whew, yeah, we want to stop uh, third party frames from loading our website and stop the permission of framing. So in our web page, when we deliver a web page out to a browser, we add a response header called uh, X frame option, same origin. And this says that, any frame trying to load me from a site other than my own will be blocked, and they can no longer load the frame. There are a couple ways around this. There are difficult ways around this, but it is possible. If you want more rigorous defense, you can add some manual JavaScript that assists in helping framing. This is one of the only defenses that the Stanford clickjacking team could not circumvent. It's not perfect. So, so let's talk about how we can use clickjacking to make money. We've seen people on Facebook do this. So it used to be called lightjacking. So you build an article on some website that you control, and you, get, and you do some clickjacking. So when people hit that page and click next page, you force the like button to be under their mouse and make them click it. So now lots and lots of people who are logged into Facebook start liking your article. It begins to bubble up the news feed and hits the top of the news feed. And now a lot of people start hitting it because it's the top of the news feed, and you swap that page out with a lot of malware, like the Zeus Trojan and, and malware droppers, and suddenly large number of users start getting hit with malware through weak browsers and other kinds of tricks to get them to install malware. So I you know this is more of a fun one than a super high level risk, I admit, but it is a problem and it demonstrates the fragility of web technology today. There's almost nothing we can do to completely stop this. There are other techniques to circumvent this, these defenses, but this is a way to make it a bit more secure. It's also very visual. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, of talking about that risk, so that, that's where I'm at. But it is possible to cause damage with it, no doubt. So app layer intrusion detection, let me just do it really quickly. We have the app sensor project. Certain fields in a, a web form, like the checkbox, the radio button, drop down select lists, multi select list are immutable. The user can't type free text into them. So suppose you have a list of countries and someone hits you with open bracket, script, end script, alert, blah, blah, blah. Then that's not possible for a user to do unless they're using an intercepting proxy. So if we can detect those, those events, we know for sure that's not a user using our site. That's an attacker trying to intercept our request and putting malformed data in. This is a way to embed intrusion detection into the app itself. Things like server-side violations of access control and immutable form widgets becoming open text for some reason. These are events that let us know for sure we're being attacked. So how about HTTPS, right? HTTPS. We have some, it provides confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. Confidentiality, nobody can sniff our data. Integrity, no one can modify our data. Authenticity, when we go hit www.bankofx.com, we know for sure we're at the right banking website. These are all the things that HTTPS and the certificate authority um, environment provides for us on the web today. Now, we also have the OWASP cheat sheet for uh, server configurators, the transport layer protection cheat sheet written by about 10 very smart people. Not myself, uh, not me. This is really tough and gnarly stuff. It's more of an administration issue. We also have strict transport security. This is a response header. When you hit, HS, when you, uh, hit a website and they deliver an HSTS header back down to your browser, that forces the browser for a certain length of time to never be able to hit that site again in anything other than HTTPS. It's a neat little standard that came from 
Andy Steingrubel, at Pay who was at PayPal at the time. Next, we have certificate pinning. So one of this, I don't want to mention any names here, for real. One of the, one of the certificate authorities, they took their root certificate, made a, basically made a copy of it, put it in a hardware security module, and everybody in the world had the CA cert in their browser, and they sold this hardware module for millions and millions of dollars, and now I, as a private company, if I bought this, I could then make copies of Gmail or make my own Facebook certs, my own Twitter certs, and man in the middle, everyone with no browser warning. And as a proxy, I'd make a connection to Gmail. And to the user, I'd, make, I'd, enter, I'd give them my fake uh, Gmail certificate, but they have that CA in their browser, so they, they say, sure, no problem. And then I take their password and give it out to Gmail, and I maintain both connections, and I now am fully man in the middle even over HTTPS for like the lead, one of the leading providers, very highly configured HTTPS setup with no browser warnings because the CA sold their stuff for profit. Now the same CA admitted to it was a problem, revoked their certificate, and they promised us they would never do this ever again, right? And we can trust the CAs, whatever. So, um, and I think this problem is widespread in the CA community. Pretty much every government can intercept and man the middle of you. So last note here, certificate pinning is when you hard code the public cert of a site into your mobile app or you deliver it to Chrome and Chrome will hard code it for you. And then if some man in the middle gives you a fake cert, it doesn't match what's hard coded in your browser, doesn't match what's hard coded in your mobile app, and, the, and, and it's rejected. This is the only way certificate pinning to get around the problems of the CA environment and virtual patching, use a WAF, there's times to use a WAF especially when you don't have availability of the code. We have the mod security core rule set for the Apache mod security firewall that's maintained by OWASP. I am done. My name, um, please, I love this stuff. This is my, my hobby and my passion, not just my job. Uh, Jim at OWASP.org is my nonprofit email. Jim at Manicode, White Hat Tech is my professional email. I'm on Twitter at Manicode, and thank you so much for coming today. Go write secure code, folks. Have a great day.